G'day, welcome to another episode of A Pirate in Chains. In fact, this is going to be the last episode in the series. And I guess it's uh, inaccurately named because our protagonist, James Jimmy Harrison, is now ex-convict 6071. And uh, we're going to explore what happened to him in the rest of his life after he received his conditional pardon and was no longer the pirate in chains. Because from this period on, one could say that his life truly began. I hope you enjoy it. The first recorded private residence that Jimmy ever lived in, in Van Diemen's Land, after being granted his ticket of leave, was here at 94 Bathurst Street. An irony of ironies, that this is the location of the State Archives Office, where every single one of the records that makes up this story is located. Jimmy was recorded uh, living here in 1858 and working uh, close by at uh, Patterson's Brewery. On January 8, 1858, uh, while living here at 94 Bathurst Street, Jimmy applied to marry one Mary Ann Hanley, but um, this was refused by the authorities. But he didn't mess around because um, seven months later, uh, on the 9th of August, 1858, he married a girl called Catherine McCarthy. And let's find out where she came from. So we're about 150 metres up the road from the location of uh, Patterson's Brewery to a location which was once called Moody's Row. St setting back from Liverpool Street down here, a row of houses with number, numbers actually according to Liverpool Street. And in number 228 lived some immigrants from Ireland, Florence McCarthy and his daughter Catherine. They were from the town of Boharu in uh, County Cork. And McCarthy is a very common name in, uh, in, the, in the county of Cork. And uh, they had immigrated out here some couple of years earlier. And it's likely, being so close to the brewery, that that's where Jimmy and Catherine may have met. So we're here at St Joseph's Catholic Church in Macquarie Street, Hobart. And whilst it was built as the Catholic Cathedral, it no longer holds that privilege, that being reserved to St Mary's Cathedral around the corner and further up the road. But St Joseph's has always been the hub of the Hobart Catholic community, with the church being built back in 1841. And on the 9th of August, 1858, Jimmy Harrison and Catherine McCarthy were married in this very church. So while Dad's history records quite extensive details about the people who witnessed the signatures and who, was, who were there as, uh, as other witnesses and who their descendants were and everything, there's one little fact that is really critical from the marriage records. And that fact is that the handwriting on the wedding certificate seems to be that of Jimmy himself. Because where it shows Catherine's uh, signature, it refers to her mark. And Jimmy's signature is different to that from the priest. So we're fairly certain it was Jimmy's. And the most interesting thing is, he records his age as 26, which means that he was born in 1830. And so in 1842, when transported as supposedly 14 for seven years, he was in fact only 12. Up 
After their marriage, Jimmy moved in with Catherine and her, her father and her stepmother here at Moody's Row. And it was here that their first two children were born. Elizabeth was born on the 7th of June, 1859, and Margaret followed a year later. And after this, then Jimmy and Catherine looked to find their own place to live. They didn't in fact move far, just around the corner to a house here across the road at 27 Barrack Street. Records show them renting this house in 1860 from a landlord named Nicholas Ray. So it was around this time that uh, Jimmy was granted his conditional pardon, which meant that he was finally free, although he could never actually leave Van Diemen's Land or potentially Australia. But it's not as simple as that. And, in, and let's just say it involves a fair bit of bureaucracy. And for that, we're gonna to have to backtrack a little. So Jimmy's ticket of leave was granted on the 1st of December, 1857. And that meant though, it was essentially like the parole system. He wasn't free, he had to report, he had to account for all his uh, comings and goings, and he had to work in, in uh, assigned areas. But he could live by himself uh, out of prison um, confinement, um, not under lock and key, and could basically control his own, own life. And that happened on the 1st of December, as I said, 1857. And then three months later, on the 16th of March, 1858, his conduct record declares that he received a deduction of one year's time granted from the period that he had to serve with a ticket of leave before his conditional pardon could be granted. And that was a reward for meritorious service at a fire. So what was the period that had to be served? This is where it gets a little bit complicated because you had to have your ticket of leave for a certain period of time uh, according to how long your original sentence was. For, for example, if you were sentenced for seven years, you had to hold your ticket of leave for one year before you could apply for a conditional pardon. If you'd been sentenced for 14 years, you had to wait for two years before you, with your ticket before you could apply. And if you'd been sentenced for life, you had to wait for three years after receiving your ticket of leave before you could apply. But let's remember, Jimmy was originally sentenced to seven years, one year wait. But then, after the Reardon robbery, he was sentenced to death, which was commuted to life, three years wait. And then whilst he was at Norfolk Island, remember he was given an additional three years to serve after he was dead? How does that change the wait? And then when he was back uh, at Port Arthur, they remitted those three years. So I'm thinking that Jimmy's application just ended up in some colonial clerk's too hard basket. And even after his pardon was granted, because his pardon was granted on the 24th of May, 1859. But he didn't take it up until the 2nd of April, 1860, almost a year later. And uh, my experience with bureaucracy in uh, two states of Australia and in the Commonwealth, that sounds about right, doesn't it? So that meant on the 2nd of April, 1860, James Jimmy Harrison, convict number 6071, was finally free. You could take this off. Free and the rest of his life could begin. So we're in uh, Goulburn Street and uh, the cottages here that you can see uh, probably date back to around the time that Jimmy lived here. Definitely these white ones date back to the 1880s. And the records show that in 1860, Jimmy lived at number 46, Goulburn Street.
So here we are at what uh, is likely 46, 46 Goulburn Street, Hobart. And um, this is indeed 46. This is a pretty significant building, not just for Jimmy, but also for me. So while the building says it's uh, the Hobart Hostel and it's 41 Barrack Street, it's on the corner, it's still 46 Goldman Street. Let's uh, nip across the road and tell you a little bit more about this building. So prior to being the uh, Hobart Hostel, um, that building across the road there, 46 uh, Goulburn Street, um, was uh, previously the Goulburn Hotel. And prior to that, it was the Doghouse Hotel. And back in the early 80s, it was the Dog and Partridge Hotel. And uh, it was quite a significant place in, uh, in my life as well. Um, I used to regularly go there on Friday nights. Um, my mate Toogs would drive me. Um, it'd be a $5 cover charge to get in to see bands like one, two, three, four and you could get pissed on the remaining $4. Um, but it's even more significant because a few years later when it uh, changed its name to the Dog House, this was the first pub where I ever sang live. Uh, doing backing vocals for the great Tasmanian band Fish John West Reject. Um, I think we sang uh, Dirty Old Town. Um, this was before they uh, went commercial. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> Jimmy living in the same place that uh, I first got the courage enough to go up on stage and, and sing live. And admittedly, those, those beers that I bought with that money actually helped. So this is uh, Victoria Street in, uh, in the centre of Hobart. But back in the 1860s, it extended into a street called Melbourne Street. And from 1868 to 1872, uh, Jimmy and Catherine lived at 22 Mel Melbourne Street. Um, the ever-present nature of the justice system in uh, Tas Tasmania, Van Diemen's Land, still remains, however. In 1879, the family moved here to a building located at 86 uh, Goulburn Street, um, further up the road from where Jimmy lived back in 1860. Um, obviously not this building, this is a newer one, but um, the building was known as Hills Rents, which means that it was uh, not necessarily shared accommodation, but certainly housed a number of people. And there was uh, at least three other families living there at the time of Jimmy and Catherine and his family. And um, the interesting thing about uh, this part of Hobart is that today it still seems to reflect um, perhaps the type of society that it reflected back in the late 1800s. Because whilst not west enough to be West Hobart, and not south enough to be South Hobart, two quite exclusive uh, Hobart suburbs, this part of Hobart um, has recently had a number of um, um, affordable housing units built um, and it's the location of uh, some support services and when you walk around um, you see the type of, type of people that you probably would have seen in the 1870s. People who are not down on their luck but people who might be struggling a bit but working really hard to support their families and uh, get along in society. Exactly what Jimmy and, uh, and his lot were doing back in the 1870s uh, and in many ways they actually built this Hobart society. So good on them. Jimmy and Catherine, being good Catholics, didn't exactly mess around in the family situation. And uh, together, between them, created 11 children being born between 1859 and 1874. The first was Elizabeth, born in June 1859, followed by Margaret in 1860. Patrick, born September 1861. And an unnamed born, boy born in 1862 who was never baptised and possibly died at birth or soon after. Then in September 1863 was Florence, and then Michael in December 1840, 1865. Uh, then Mary Ann, July 1867. Uh, young James, November 1868. They'd had so many they were running out of names by now, because the next one was young Catherine, born July 1870. And finally, there was Thomas, born January 1872 and all of whom were baptised here in this very church 
St Joseph's Catholic Church, which stands here today. Well, Jimmy had his last run in with the law back in 1887. It wasn't for another 18 years that another Harrison had uh, a first encounter with the authorities. Michael was 14 at the time and working in uh, one of the tanneries, you know, one of those ones further upstreams that uh, potentially gave Patterson's Brewery beer its uh, unique flavour and colour. And Michael was sent for a month to the Hobart Jail, the Tench, for stealing a purse. And less than a month later, he was in trouble again. This time stealing a quantity of iron from a uh, Mr James Mulcahy. Less than a year later, he was back in trouble again, this time charged by a certain Constable Delaney uh, with stealing a vest valued at six and a half shillings. And this Constable Delaney, we're not sure what his background is, but um, he uh, seems to have a little bit of involvement with the Harrison family. And for that uh, episode in stealing the vest, Michael was sentenced to two months hard labour. It was actually uh, required that he was kept separate from the other prisoners. We're not sure whether that was for his good or for theirs. Young James, even though he was only nine, was also in trouble, finding himself in the tench for stealing three handkerchiefs. Um, at least he's taken after his father in one respect and he's stealing three of something, but three handkerchiefs, a little bit more useful than three shoes. Anyway, that one lesson was enough for James Jr. because he was never in trouble again. But for Michael, uh, things got a little bit worse. Michael used to take after Jimmy Senior never knowing when to give up. And in April 1881, him and another Samuel Adams were charged again by Constable Delaney. And this time, quote, a quantity of apples growing in the garden, the property of Mary Ann Elliot, the said apples being the value of threepence. Now reading between the lines, it might seem that Constable Delaney had it in for the Harrison uh, children, because um, the apples were valued at threepence, and yet, Punishment didn't exactly seem to fit the crime. Michael was sentenced to a month in jail, a fine of 20 shillings and sixpence, and court costs of two shillings and threepence. The financial penalty alone was 93 times the value of the apples. In any respect, at least it was that financial penalty that may have motivated Michael to give up a life of crime, because he was never in trouble again. However, Constable Delaney had not yet finished with the Harrison children. Because in 1882, he found the youngest child, 10-year-old Thomas, guilty of idleness and disorderly. And, believe it or not, for that, Delaney sent Thomas to the tench for a week. A 10-year-old kid sent to jail for being idle and disorderly. Uh, Constable Delaney, we've got a word for you and it's the first syllable of the term of your rank. Anyway, that last offence for young 10-year-old Thomas was, as far as we know, the last time that any Harrison has ever been in trouble with the law until they invented really fast motorbikes and uh, speed cameras. Yeah, my bad. This is uh, Sandy Bay Road, um, one of the main thoroughfares out of Hobart still, and certainly was the main thoroughfare out of Hobart back in the 1880s. And uh, behind us, uh, you can see uh, St George's Church on top of St George's Hill on Battery Point. It's recorded that in uh, June 1881, Jimmy was working as a labourer uh, on St George's Hill, and uh, we would turn along this road uh, to get back to his house. And um, the Mercury actually records something uh, quite interesting. And uh, excuse me for putting on my glasses because I'm going to have to read this aloud. But it says, 18th June, 1881, run over by a vehicle. James Harrison, 51 years of age, who resides in Melbourne Street, was admitted to the General Hospital yesterday evening. The injured man was returning to town from his work on St George's Hill. And when, on Sandy Bay Road, he was run over by a vehicle and stunned. Dr Holden examined the man at the hospital and it was found that two of his ribs were broken 
and then he had a severe cut on his forehead besides having received other injuries. So it seems like uh, negotiating the traffic uh, back in 1881, well before there were any cars or other motor vehicles, um, was equally hazardous. And that was in fact the second time ever in his uh, period uh, in Van Diemen's Land and Tasmania as a convict and later free man that he was ever admitted to hospital for medical treatment. Not a bad effort, I reckon. Pretty resilient old bugger. 51 as well. Now this uh, last location is a little bit of a mystery um, which itself is a little bit disappointing because uh, this was to be the, uh, the last place that uh, Jimmy resided. Dad's history records that uh, in 1884 Jimmy was living uh, around about here in a place called Boys Square opposite what is uh, used to be uh, the largest hardware store in Hobart K&D on Melville Street. Um, so it may well have been here. Uh, apparently it was close to a pub called the Nags Head, which I can't exactly find the location of. But complicating the fact is that the map that Dad attaches uh, to his history shows Boys Square being a block and a half further up the road. So we'll walk up there and see if it's at least a little bit more scenic uh, than this car park here. So this is the location on the map that uh, is included in Dad's history where he records as being located uh, Boys Square. James and Catherine were living here in 1884 at least. And um, this is a pretty sad location because uh, it was here that uh, both James and Catherine um, came to the ends of their lives. On the 1st of May 1884, at the age of only 43, Catherine passed away. She'd given birth to 11 children uh, in that uh, short period of time and the cause of death was recorded as general debility. Um, so we're not, not exactly sure what, uh, what caused that uh, rather tragic death and Jimmy lived here for another three years after that. So we're here up on uh, Knock Lofty Reserve, um, which is um, a ridge line that runs uh, behind West Hobart. Um, and uh, as you've seen from the drive, straight up Goulburn Street, straight up Forest Road to, uh, to this wonderful, peaceful area that is still um, 
Beloved by many residents of, of Hobart today, uh, the Knocklofty Reserve. And um, we're going to uh, now hear from an extract from the Hobart Mercury. And again, please forgive me for having to put on my glasses to read this to you because um, this one reads uh, from the 27th of July, 1887. The death of an old identity. A well-known character, known in the flesh as Knocklofty Jimmy, passed over to the great majority last Monday morning. The old fellow, whose real name was James Harrison, was picked upon the wharf one day last week in a state of insensibility and was conveyed to the hospital by the police. Upon examination, he was found to be suffering from a stroke of paralysis. He never spoke after his admission to the institution and passed away very peacefully at the last. He will doubtless be remembered by many who have attended our anniversary regattas as the man who took the part of the duck in the time-honoured duck hunt. He used to enter for that event every year and always gave it a thrilling interest by his wonderful powers as a swimmer and his pluck in diving, as he always selected the topsail yard of the flagship to dive from. Only recently he challenged another man to swim down to the iron pot and went to the wharf fully prepared to start, taking with him a small lunch, which he intended to fix upon his head and eat upon the way down. But the other man did not turn up. He could tell many interesting tales of his Norfolk Island experience, and at one time, quote, took to the bush in order to get away from Port Arthur. At the time of his death, he must have been about 80 years of age, although in appearance, he was much younger. That's correct, because he was actually only 56. Knock lofty Jimmy. Can't quite see the iron pot from here, but I'd just like to let you know that I just sailed in a yacht race down there just this very morning. Good on you, Jimmy. Here's to you. Dad's history records that uh, that extract from the Mercury, uh, a eulogy to an ex-convict who clearly had a respected position within um, some levels of Hobart society, was quote, framed and displayed at Pat Moore's Antiques uh, here in Liverpool Street in Hobart by the then owner John Joseph Jack Patmore. Uh, Jack's mother Kate, um, who started the business, was uh, the fifth and the youngest child of Jimmy and Catherine. Well, I never heard of the Patmores. Um, there's no Patmore's Antiques here in um, Liverpool Street anymore. You do a Google search, they don't exist. Um, so I'm really actually fascinated about my father's view of family history. Because one of my big issues with him was on his approach to family. Um, it's likely due to generational circumstances, like he didn't have a relationship with his father Keith, and Keith uh, lost his father Percy, who was killed in the First World War. Um, Keith didn't bond with his stepfather, who um, gave me my amazing middle name, Lindhurst. He called himself Bill. Um, and so, and Keith himself went off to the Second World War when Dad was um, was was one, or maybe maybe even two. Came back injured, uh, very distant. So we've at least had two generations of of no father figure before um, us kids came along. So it was no surprise after two generations of missing fathers that, that dad perhaps didn't really know how to uh, act like one. But the attitude to family is actually indeed stranger than that. Because for all his passion about family history, dad's view of it is like intellectual peripheral, um, at most complementary to the reality, but not actually to the personal. Um, put it this way, I'm 60 years old. 
And I don't know of a single relative of mine named Harrison. Except, of course, my uh, sister Ingrid and uh, Dad's wife, Vicky. And ironically, I'm not actually related to either of them. Uh, Ingrid being adopted and uh, Vicky being Dad's second wife, not my mother. Um, although, a brief aside here, Ingrid is the member of the family that I am the absolute most closest to, both, both friendship-wise, but also personality-wise and attitude to life. It's just uncanny. The other relatives that I'm aware of are relatives from Dad's sister, Jenny, and her kids and their kids, um, and his cousins, um, Michael and, uh, and Uncle Dave, um, and their kids. Um, but Jimmy and Catherine had 11 children. And even allowing for 2.5 children per generation, let alone the breeding like Catholics like they were, there's potentially 5,000 living relatives of mine living today here in Tasmania or, or maybe elsewhere. And with five of Jimmy and Catherine's kids being boys and actually named Harrison, there's potentially a thousand relatives of mine named Harrison. I don't know one of them. I could well be related to the owners of the uh, jeweler's shop behind me. 75 metres from Jimmy's first residence as a, as a free man. I probably am, but I don't know. And do they know? And more to the point, do they have any idea about the pirate in chains? Here he is. The family honours the memory of James Harrison. Harrison, son of Patrick Morris, born 1829 and transported here in 1842. And Catherine, his wife, born Bohabu Island in December 1838 and emigrated in 1856 to join her father, Florence McCarthy. James and Catherine were married at St. Joseph's in Hobart on 9 August 1858. Catherine died 1 May 1884, aged 45, and James died 27 July 1887, aged 58. This plaque also honours their children, Elizabeth, Margaret, Patrick, Florence, Michael, Mary Ann, James, Catherine, Thomas and Honora. So I must admit this is the first time I've ever actually seen this uh, gravestone here um, at uh, Cornelian Bay Cemetery in the Roman Catholic section and there's a couple of uh, interesting things on this stone that are, that, um, are puzzling me. Um, firstly, who put it there? Because um, clearly Dad didn't put it there because there's there's different birth dates or birth years there. Um, according to our calculations, he was born in 1830 and he was 56 when he died, um, not 58. So. Um, yeah, a bit of an, another family mystery. There's other Harrisons out there. Who would have thought? So, uh, we've come to the end of the story. But I thought it would be better to end it here at uh, St. Joseph's Church rather than ending it at the cemetery. Um, there's no record of whether there was a funeral here for Jimmy at St. Joseph's. Um, but still it is the most appropriate place because in reality his life didn't end here it actually began here it began with the wedding to Catherine in 1858 followed shortly by his freedom and one could actually say that that's when Jimmy's life truly began ironically began here just one city block away from where he was sentenced to death he was 28 years old when he married Catherine and he died when he was 56. So half of his life passed in freedom and the other half, well, there's nine other episodes about that. For 12 years he'd been a street urchin in Salford in Manchester and for 16 years a convict and for two days at least a pirate. But from here he was finally free. 
He became a husband, a father, a provider to his family, an avid sportsman, and a respected member of the community, particularly if that uh, eulogy to knock lofty Jimmy is anything to go by. Um, and the very fact that that story appeared in the Mercury is the number one story after the political and judicial stories of the day, and uh, a lead story before a story about some school boys from the Hutchins School performing a burlesque performance. Oh well, what would they say about those Hutchins boys? So here's to you, Knock Lofty Jimmy, the pirate in chains. I'm proud to be your great, great, great grandson. Thanks for watching.